the TIADA, and he has authored several manuals for dealers. Please welcome Michael Dunnigan. Thanks, Joe. Well, good morning. I have the fun job of talking about a topic that's near and dear to dealers, uh, and that's litigation. Uh, and uh, I, I was charged with coming up with top 10 items that, that dealers would be most interested in hearing about with regard to litigation issues. And what I've tried to do is take 40, almost 40 years of experience representing dealers and kind of distill some of the issues that I see keep coming up over and over again, uh, and, and also some of the, the more recent trends of things uh, to give you kind of an overview. And, and without having time to go into the substance of all of these issues, I'm, it's more an opportunity, I think, to kind of make you aware of them, and then you can get the information from these other sources that um, you already have available to you when you need, need a little further explanation of these things. As I say, I've tried to cover things that are, I've had actual experience litigating. I, from day one, when I got into this business, uh, I've been representing dealers in litigation cases. Uh, and after a while, you build up sort of a, a, a knowledge of, of what are some of the issues and problems and, and what I have really tried to do through the educational resources of TIADA and the other groups um, that I work with is to educate dealers on what these problems are so they can take steps to make, uh, to prepare to, to avoid getting into these fixes. Because once you do get into litigation, it gets very expensive very fast. And I've always said the best lawsuit is the one that never gets filed. Uh, and I spend a lot of time really trying to talk dealers out of getting into litigation because of the cost and the, and the other toll it takes uh, emotionally, time-wise, downtime, uh, pressure on employees, and so on. So um, that's sort of the overview of, of what we want to uh, talk about here today. Let's see if my... As sort of a, uh, an overview, here's some general principles that I, I like to, to cite when I do an article. Uh, or speak to, some, speak to a group of dealers about litigation issues. Um, the first item here, keep paperwork compliant. You've been hearing uh, a lot about compliance uh, over the last few days and hours. Uh, and I'm not going to go into all of that stuff, but here, the point here is when your customer gets buyer's remorse and they go to an attorney, the first thing the attorney does is start going through the paperwork, looking for gotcha violations. They're a lot easier in many cases to act upon than are uh, some of the other uh, more subjective kinds of, of consumer issues. So if you've got compliant paperwork, you're going to uh, be in a position where the attorney may look at it and just say, look, this, this person knows what they're doing. Uh, we really don't have much to go on here, and it certainly will avoid them having a gotcha violation that may create uh, an automatic penalty and attorney's fees can make you vulnerable. And that's what I've been seeing a lot of over the years is we get these lawsuits filed on truth and lending and other technical aspects where someone just screwed up on their contract. Uh, and the initial complaint was one of, oh, the dealer won't fix the transmission. But the attorney says, hey, there's nothing in that. There's no money in that. Uh, but I got, I got a gotcha violation here. So keeping the paperwork compliant um, will maybe help avoid uh, some of the other litigation issues. I'm going to talk a little later about avoiding the customer from hell. This is sort of counterintuitive from anyone in the sales business uh, of turning a customer down. Uh, but I'm a big believer in it. I'm a big believer because I have seen over the years uh, when, when a case comes into my office, the dealer invariably says, you know, I knew I shouldn't have done that deal. Uh, and that's telling me something, that, that the, the dealer was picking up on something and maybe that the dealer should have acted upon it. And so I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about how to avoid the customer from hell, and if you get one, what to do. Uh, be quick to undo a bad deal is just a general principle. Uh, one thing I have found out representing especially buy here, pay here dealers is when there is some type of issue that comes up that creates tension 
between the dealer and the customer, it don't get any better. It just goes typically downhill from there. And so when you sense, maybe this is a person I shouldn't have done business with, or maybe this is a deal shouldn't have been done, the earlier you can undo it, the better and the cheaper it's going to be. So consider that as an option, especially if it looks like this could go, be an ongoing problematic issue with this particular consumer. Uh, everything is negotiable. I have dealers call me and say, attorney called, customer called, they want this, they want that. Do I have to do it? And my answer is, well, I don't know that you have to unless the court orders you to, but you may want to consider trying to negotiate something because everything is negotiable. Uh, and you want to get in writing and get a release if there is some type of reduction of price or some type of, of, of money returned or something. Uh, that will serve as a defense if, if another action is brought later. But everything is negotiable, and keep that in mind. Always settle before you get to court. It really starts getting expensive when you start getting to the, to the, the court level. So if there's an opportunity to settle before, that's the time to do it. Attorney's fees start racking up, uh, deposition fees, and so on, uh, and that's when it really gets expensive. And, and this final point I want to make here is something that when I first got into the business, a lot of dealers would tell me, you know, I sell my cars as is, um, so I really don't have anything to worry about, do I? And, and in general, that was pretty accurate. But then we had something that, that came along, and, and in Texas, it's called the Texas Deceptive Trade Practices Act. You've been hearing about UDAP the last few days as a sort of a federal concept, but this is the same thing and it changed the paradigm. And all of a sudden, selling as is doesn't really remove any potential liability. All it, selling as is does is say there is no warranty. Well, the lawsuits being brought are not being brought for breach of warranty. They're being brought for misrepresentation under the Deceptive Trade Practices Act. So don't rely on just the fact that you're selling as is to, uh, to be some type of protector from any kind of consumer issues that might come up. All right, number one item I want to talk about getting into specifics. Uh, and, and the reason I put this number one is because I, the, the, the most expensive lawsuits I've been seeing here lately have involved some type of action for wrongful repossession or specifically breach of the peace. And um, so it's something I think that you need to be aware of, especially if you're in the buy here, pay here business or even your finance company. Um, and, and you're doing repossessions, uh, this, is, this is an area which I think has a lot of potential liability with higher damages than some of the more technical issues or problems you might run into. And here's the problem. Texas and a number of other states, in fact, I think it's pretty much the majority point of view now, have, uh, through court rulings, Supreme Court of Texas, for instance, have, have ruled that a car creditor, the lien holder, is liable for any tortious activity, that is some type of violation of law that leads to an injury, uh, be it to property or to person, uh, even though that repossession agent was an independent contractor. And that's a change in law, because prior to that, you hired an independent contractor, that independent contractor had all the liability, and it ended there. These cases have said, no, we're gonna go to the bank, to the credit union, to the dealer, who hired that independent, that independent uh, agent because many cases after the damage is done, the independent agent disappears or has no assets or has no ability to respond in damages uh, to the claim. Uh, and and the, the actual case in Texas involved uh, a bank, M-Bank, uh, where their independent repossessor committed a, a pretty bad port uh, and, and the jury found liability uh, and the original court said, well, but it stops uh, at this repossessor, who, of course, had disappeared. Uh, it went up to the Supreme Court of Texas. The Supreme Court held in a five to four opinion that, that this is a, a dangerous activity. Self-help repossession is, and as such, goes to a higher standard. Uh, and, and, and thus, we're going to say that, that the, the, the person who hired that agent has responsibility, has liability. And so that changed the dynamics, and a lot of people aren't aware of that. They think that hiring the agent is going to protect them, and it's really not. And so it, it, there are some issues uh, that are raised because of this change in the law. 
Uh, here are some due diligence suggestions I make. This is, this is a list of things I've compiled uh, to advise my clients on uh, how to approach it because the problem is when, if you don't do the due diligence beforehand, you're going to end up with a lawsuit. Uh, and I, I have defended uh, a number of these lately um, and, and involving some fairly high damage claims um, and usually injury of some kind or a knife is pulled or a gun is pulled or something like that. And so these are the steps that I would suggest that you do now before you have one of these claims in order to protect yourself. And by the way, there is an there, uh, uh, article uh, that has all of this uh, in, in your materials and the handouts, but let's just hit the highlights here. Uh, it, it is so important to pick the right agent, and, 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 and most dealers tell me after they get sued, they said, well, this guy was $100, $150 per car lower uh, than the other folks out there. And, and my answer is building elevators and repossessing cars is not a job you want to give to the low bidder. There are certain things that there's justification for spending more money. And, and certainly, you want to stay clear of the, the repossessor who has a bad reputation, the guy that um, uh, you know, carries the sawed-off shotgun around. Uh, anyone that's named the big hurt, you want to stay away from. Um, and so when, when, when you find out about the bad reputation, they may be the most effective repossessors, but that may be for a reason. Um, and, and the potential liability is too great. Um, require that your agent have proper insurance coverage. That is, coverage for wrongful repossessions or breach of the peace. And a lot of the cases that have come to me, uh, we've asked for the insurance uh, from the repossessor, and he produces just a standard Texas motor vehicle liability policy. Well, that, that ain't going to cover anything. Or I've had them pr produce a document that says a, a fidelity bond uh, ain't going to help. Uh, and so make sure that they have the proper insurance. Um, number one, if, if they're not serious about the business, uh, and don't, to, enough to have proper insurance, then, then they're, they're probably too high risk. Um, and, and number two, when, when, the, when the case comes, you want to have insurance ahead of you and ahead of your insurance to step in and defend this case. Uh, the next item, consider getting your own insurance as a fallback. I will tell you the standard uh, liability, garage liability policy in Texas excludes specifically excludes any kind of wrongful repossession action. Uh, there, there, there's one company I know of that has a policy that doesn't specifically exclude it, and they actually have defended uh, one of my client dealers uh, who got, got sued on, on one of those situations. Um, but you want to ask the question of your agent and see if there is some type of rider available or some type of extra coverage you can pay for uh, in order to have some type of fallback. One of the things we have found in handling these cases is a lot of times the cost of defense is greater than the actual damages that you're running into, because these are very expensive types of lawsuits uh, to litigate. Here's something that I've added to my list here recently, um, and that is consider paying the extra money and hiring someone who is, is affiliated with one of the national organizations that carries, say, a million dollar, um, either some type of bond or insurance uh, to cover uh, these types of situations. Number one, those people usually are pre-qualified before they're uh, allowed to be a member of these organizations. Um, but number two, they do have that uh, uh, extra coverage. They are usually uh, professionals in the business with, with multiple vehicles and facili permanent facilities. And that's what you're looking for here is someone with permanence uh, that is going to be around and is going to help you when, when one of these cases comes up. Yes, it does cost more, but paying that extra may be the insurance that you want to buy um, to uh, have the peace of mind be able to sleep at night. Uh, and, and then this last item is think about when you run into a difficult situation, a vehicle's locked up, uh, rather than have someone uh, break into a garage or cut a lock or cut a, cut a chain or something, you may want to consider going through legal process. Yes, it is expensive. Yes, it is time consuming. Yes, it is a pain in the neck. Uh, but it is the safe way 
uh, to get the process done because with a court order, the sheriff can go out in uniform and gun and, and take care of taking possession for you. Uh, one of the things we found on, uh, with regard to the economics of this, when I started out, um, it just, the cost was really too great unless you had an in with a, a district, uh, or not a district attorney, but a, a JP, local JP, who might handle these cases for you and give you a writ. Um, the cost of hiring an attorney was too great given the, uh, the value of the vehicle. That's all changed. Uh, and now you're putting a lot more risk out on the street, the value of the vehicles are much higher, and we're finding that the cost of doing this process is often justified. A number of our clients, uh, once the, 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 the repossession agent calls and says, look, it's locked up, uh, it's stashed, it's hidden, it's whatever, uh, then we suggest we, we go into to the legal process. Now one thing this legal process won't help is just finding someone who has skipped. You've got to know either where the vehicle is or where the person, either the person who owes you the money or the person who is holding possession of it. All right, any questions now on, on repossession, due diligence, potential liability? Okay, item number two. Um, this is a phrase I coined a number of years ago because I, I kept seeing these patterns of, of problem customers coming up and that they were the source of, of the lawsuits and filing the litigation. And I thought, you know, wouldn't it be interesting if you kind of did a little underwriting beyond just financial underwriting with your customers um, and, and look at, at some of the, the things that may lean toward the indication that this may be a problem customer. I put a list here um, of, of the types of people uh, to, to look carefully at doing, doing business with, and, and I'm sure you'll see this. One of my, one of my clients uh, at, at one of my seminars saw this list, and he went down and he said, hey, you've just eliminated about 95% of my customers. Uh, that's not the intention, obviously, but um, I think it is something that you want to think about um, because you don't want to sell into a lawsuit. Uh, and when we're thinking about uh, litigation prevention, then this may be uh, something you want to add to your, your uh, procedures um, and, and thought process when you are sizing up a deal to see if you really want to do it. And here's, here's the item down toward the bottom. Anyone your gut tells you to avoid. Remember I told you earlier, every one of these lawsuits, the dealer would say, you know, I knew I shouldn't have done that deal. That's gut. And, and a lot of times your gut is right. Uh, and you want to listen to it. All right, before we go into odometers, I, I do want to address what do I do if I get a hold of a customer from hell, despite caution and despite problems. And let me give you an example. Uh, this happened just last week. Had a dealer call me. Uh, actually, he had called a couple weeks before. I got a problem customer. Uh, I, I work with her, I bend over backwards, I extend, I let her you know, do all something, but every time I do something good, she calls back screaming and threatening and, and she threatens my employees and, and she's just this constant source of tension here around the office that has got everybody on edge. And, and he said, what do I do? And I said, well, my, my advice is cut her loose. Figure out a way to cut her loose, get rid of her. She's causing more damage to your business operation than whatever money you potentially could make off of this deal. Um, and, and so that has been my advice when you, you run into the customer from hell. It turned out this woman is probably bipolar because she would come in one time as just all sweetness and, and she was happy, everything's great. And then the next time she's screaming and threatening and accusing um, unrealistically. Um, and so the first time he called, I said, you know, my advice is to cut her loose. Well, he calls back a couple of weeks later and said, well, I didn't take your advice. I, I forgave one of the payments, made her happy, um, but now we got new problems and she said that her, her, she had had to abandon her car for some reason. Well, we found it through the GPS and we picked it up to protect it for her. Now she's calling, accusing us of stealing her car. And, and, and I said, yeah, it just ain't gonna get better. It ain't gonna get any better. Now's, now's actually two weeks ago was the time, but now's the time to li literally cut it off. And he said, man, I just, I hate to, to give in to someone when I know I didn't do anything wrong. I said, well, it's your choice. Uh, but so 
anyway, I, I drew up a, a release for him. He basically forgave the, the indebtedness, a couple thousand dollars on the car, gave her the, the title, got her to sign a full release. And he called me back and he said, you know, it just lifted about a ton of weight off my shoulders. I, I didn't want to do it, but man, I'm so glad I did. So anyway, consider how you can make your life better by instead of confronting some of these folks, maybe just getting rid of them, let them go harass your competition down the street. Um, so consider that as one of the, the ways to deal with this. All right, let's talk about odometer issues. This is still a problem, although it's changed in character from when I got into the business 40 years ago. Uh, rollbacks were a major problem. Um, and in fact, I remember, I hadn't been in the business too long when, when I saw there was a report on 60 Minutes. And many of you, well, looking at the average age out here, uh, I'm not so sure that, that many of you would have seen that program. But um, the program involved a, uh, a guy in Houston, Texas, who was spinning odometers. And the reporter, with microphone and with cameras, and openly said, we're from 60 Minutes, and we wanted to talk to you. The guy starts, he opens up, and he says, yeah, we charge $20 a deal. We can, get it. We can run 60 of them through here a day, and we average about 30,000 miles run back on every car. He just, on camera, as if there was nothing wrong with what he was doing. And of course, this makes a big splash, and now every dealer in Houston, Texas, and probably around the world, uh, was implicated um, by what, what this guy was doing. He went to prison, um, but I think that was part of the attitude was, hey, everybody's doing it. There's nothing wrong with it. Everybody's doing it. It's just part of the, part of the trade. Well, the government didn't look at it that way. Uh, and soon after that, there were some new regulations that came out, and uh, they really tightened down on both the disclosure of odometer mileage and actual uh, penalties for uh, tampering with and so on. Uh, and I, I think largely the problems seemed to pretty much go away. I mean, there were pockets of, of, of problems here and there, but uh, technology changed things. Um, uh, so it... it seemed to me I was getting less uh, feedback from my, my dealers that they were having, having problems until more recently things started coming back up. And, and, and what has changed is, is a lot of it is the technology, but they're not being accused of rolling back odometers anymore, which obviously uh, is, is a crime and, a, and it gives rise to civil liability. Uh, but what we're seeing the lawsuits filed on have to do with um, I found that the buyer finds out after they buy the car that the car actually has more miles than what was on the odometer. Uh, they find out through, they take it to a safety inspection. Inspection keeps the, the, the mileage. Uh, if warranty work was done on it and, and they come to the dealer and they say, hey, uh, this car had 100,000 miles more than it has now two years ago when it was inspected or when it was repaired uh, at the dealership. Um, and to, to make things more frustrating, a lot of times this stuff isn't showing up in the uh, uh, title defect reporting services that in many cases you're paying for, uh, for your customers. And um, uh, it doesn't show up until later. And even sometimes these reporting services uh, issue an amended report after you make the retail sale saying, yeah, this car had 100,000 more miles two years ago. Well, obviously your customer is, number one, not happy. Number two, they think you're the biggest crook that ever came down the pike. You're spinning odometers or you're, you're committing odometer fraud. That's their first assumption. And a lot of them go running to an attorney. They won't even come and, and talk to you about it. Uh, and so we're seeing some of these lawsuits filed um, just kind of automatically. Um, and in fact, the dealer uh, is, is, is uh, uh, also a victim uh, in, in the process. Uh, and most of them know they're going to take care and when they find out there is a problem, and certainly that is my advice, is you need to take care of your customer first thing, and then you start looking at your remedies going back, but you take care of your customer first when you run into one of these prob problems. All right, here, uh, here are some of the, the reasons that, that I, I'm seeing uh, an up, uptick now in, in lawsuits, consumer lawsuits brought that involve mileage. Number one, there is a big problem because quite often the title certificate, which is the document in which uh, official odometer disclosure is made, is not present at closing. 
that when the government came up with their rules, uh, they decided, look, if we can get the, the seller and the buyer at a table signing off on the title, both of them sign at the same time, both of them see the disclosure uh, that's on the, the title certificate, they can eliminate a lot of the problems. What they didn't realize was you don't always have the title sitting there at closing. Uh, and, and that creates another problem in that there, not only are you not actually making the official uh, uh, disclosure to your customer, which is done on the title certificate when that happens, but in many case, cases there's not any type of odometer disclosure other than maybe an entry of the odometers on the contract uh, or on the, uh, the buyer's order. Um, and then when a problem comes up, um, even if it's a, an exempt vehicle or an older vehicle or the title actually shows the actual miles, the customer says, hey, I didn't know that. Nobody told me that. It wasn't disclosed. And, and so um, that, that title not present is a source of a lot of, a lot of problems. Uh, this uh, TMU um, is something that a lot of dealers, when they get that lawsuit, they come to me and say, hey, I put TMU on the title. I don't have any problems, do I? So, well. Number one, did your, did your customer know what TMU means? A lot of them don't. Um, number two, uh, that's not a magic waiver of, of liability if there is a, a, uh, an issue or a problem with mileage that shows up, up later. So don't be relying on TMU as the be all and end all uh, of, of, of odometer problems. Here's another problem that I run into, and, and this is something you just need to be aware of. Uh, a lot of dealers call me and say, okay, I got these lawsuit papers on this car. Hey, it's 12, year, 12 years old. It's exempt. And I put exempt on the title. I don't have any liability, do I? Well, yes, you do. Why? Why would I have liability if the vehicle's exempt? It is exempt from the federal disclosure that goes on the title certificate. It is not exempt from consumer laws, the UDAPs, and the Texas Deceptive Trade Practice Act, which says that a seller has to accurately disclose the characteristics and qualities of the product they're selling. And so the lawsuit is brought for a misrepresentation um, because the, they find out the car actually had more miles on it than the odometer uh, had shown. Um, and exempt does not protect you from these uh, consumer uh, lawsuits, especially in Texas, but most other states that have some type of UDAP, and I suspect uh, the feds are probably going to put their blanket over all of this too. So don't assume that if a car is over 10 years old, even though it's exempt from federal disclosure, that ends the problem. Uh, there, there's definitely another problem there. It's one you need to be aware of. Um, all right, this, this last item, uh, instrument clusters replaced. This is the new rollback. This is the this is the rollback uh, of, of the 2000s. This is how um, I'm seeing a lot of, of, of odometer uh, issues. Right, here, here we're talking again about uh, the title not being present and, and how that can, can be a problem. And I recommend in this last item that you use at closing, if you don't have the title certificate, some type of, of old odometer statement disclosure form. It doesn't meet federal requirements but it serves as a disclosure to your customer and you can use it to disclose any problems or issues that you may suspect this vehicle has more miles than the odometer indicates. Uh, and here's a place you can write, write that in, have it signed or initialed by your customer. They're happy with the car. They don't care whether it's 200,000 miles or 300,000 miles. Fine, let them sign off on it uh, and you've made a disclosure, not just of, of what the odometer says, but you've made a disclosure of facts uh, that help your, your consumer be more informed, and more importantly, that can be used as a defense if you get the letter from the attorney saying, well, there's an, there's an odometer issue on this car. Um, again, the exemption applies only to federal disclosure. It doesn't really affect things in terms of state law. Uh, consumers still rely on the odometer mileage, and we've had cases where um, maybe uh, a discussion was made about the, the miles may not be or probably aren't, aren't correct, but people rely on that odometer, and if, if there's a number on that odometer and there's nothing in writing to disclaim what's on that odometer, 
the judges and courts believe that people are entitled to rely on what's on that odometer. Uh, and so that's where we're seeing a, a difference between the attitudes of, of consumers, judges, lawyers on one hand, juries, uh, and then dealers on the other hand. And by the way, that jury that's going to be hearing this case is going to be made up of 12 good and faithful citizens who are all car buyers, and there will not be one car seller on that jury panel. And so be aware, and uh, you know, when you get into the litigation, uh, things are going to be stacked against you a little bit. Uh, again, the, the swap clusters, the new rollback um, of, of the modern technology age, uh, if you are involved in a swap out of a cluster, you are supposed to have put a sticker on the door frame, says this was the mileage on the old one that was taken off, this was the mileage on the new one when it was installed. Um, and I'm seeing litigation, I'm seeing lawsuits, I'm seeing criminal prosecution. I mentioned this Dallas case. The Dallas dealer would go, he was going all around the country to Highline sales buying uh, high mileage Mercedes and Lexuses, bring them back to Dallas and swap out the instrument cluster. And oh, coincidentally, every new instrument cluster he put in showed lower miles than the one that he took out. But that was just coincidence, he said. Uh, he was questioned uh, by the prosecutor why every car he, he, he brought in had a, a swap cluster. He says, oh, everybody knows Mercedes has defective electronics and you just have to automatically do this. Federal judge wasn't buying this, and he got prison time um, as, as a result of that scheme. So I, I still get calls from dealers every once in a while. Uh, my customers complaining about the mileage. Um, you know, I swapped out the cluster. I said, well, did you disclose to them what the mileage was before, the fact that it was swapped out, that it had lower mileage? And again, it always has lower mileage. Um, and, and what a problem that can create. Uh, because people do rely on what is on that, that odometer. So anyway, be aware of that. And, and my concern for, for my clients and for you is that you get victimized by this. So be aware of, of what's going on out there and, and be on your toes so you don't get caught in the middle of one of those. Number four, is arbitration right for you? I suspect there have been a lot of discussions about arbitration here earlier, and I don't want to get into a lot of detail. The materials. In, in your booklet were actually written before AAA made their change in rules. And I don't want to get into a lot of that uh, detail other than to say we do have a, a changed uh, landscape here because of, of the actions by AAA in terms of the pre-approval of your form, uh, the costs, the cost not just of submitting the form for pre-approval, but also the upfront costs that they make a dealer uh, or business person pay in a consumer uh, case. They pretty much indicated they just don't want to be in the business anymore. And that is problematic um, if you're relying on your, your, uh, uh, your arbitration agreement. Uh, one of the, the alternatives that has been suggested, there's an or organization named JAMS uh, that, that is still uh, friendly to businesses, in term, not in terms of their outcomes, but in terms of keeping the cost down and being available, and you might want to look into that as an alternative. And I know that Stephen has changed, put out a memo to AutoStar people uh, telling them about the, the change and putting jams in as one of the alternatives. Uh, one of the things I'm looking at doing is just eliminating AAA, uh, having jams only in there um, as, as a possibility for those folks who want to continue doing our arbitration agreements but without having all of, facing all of the costs. Um, but I'll, again, defer to the folks who, the experts on that who've been talking about it, um, pay attention to uh, what's going on. Number five, uh, collections. I'm seeing a lot of, of litigation and threats of litigation involving um, collection activities. Here's the big problem. The big problem is, especially if you're in the subprime market, buy your pay here, your business model revolves around collection activities. And quite often, they are intense collection activities. And quite often, your customers want it. They want you to remind them. They want you to prod them. Uh, and so we're in this situation where um, uh, the activities that are normal in the buy here, pay here business may be seen by the feds and others as being invasive. 
or harassment. And if they start looking at the number of contacts that are made um, and, and how aggressive uh, the calling is, the prompting, uh, the reminders, uh, outside of the context of the subprime market, it may look to someone that, wow, this is just obscene. This is harassment. Uh, but it is normal in, in, in this industry. And so I think we need to be aware that we may be looked at, um, we in the subprime market may be looked at uh, from, from a prime sort of perspective, uh, and it may be seen that these activities that are so normal in what we do may be looked at as, as, as not being proper or normal. So keep that in mind uh, in setting up your, your collection uh, policies and activities. Uh, one of the things that I'm seeing a lot of uh, letters and, and actually have a lawsuit, uh, lawsuit filed in federal court uh, in Fort Worth involving the use of a robocaller and the, the allegation of harassment uh, in terms of the frequency of calls and, and of the nature of the calls. Um, dealer swears none of it's true. Uh, we have now gathered the data uh, from, um, from the software uh, to, to give to the plaintiff's attorney to show that their allegations are not, not correct. But this is a lot of work and a lot of expense to go to. And one of the things I recommended to this client was they dial back the number of calls that were being made. Again, in my ear pay here, it, it probably was not that out, out of, of reasonable range, but to an outsider, it may look like it is going overboard. Um, and so the, the, the auto dialers, I think, are a problem you need to really stay on top of and be careful with. Um, be careful about calling uh, uh, the place of employment, especially if there's been a verbal request that you stop. Uh, be careful about contacting through uh, text or electronic where there's a, a fee charge to your customer. Uh, if they ask you to stop, you're supposed to stop. Um, and, and so look at these activities and see if, if there's anything that might bring you, make you subject to some of these problems. Uh, under the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, there is private uh, enforcement, and that's why we're seeing private lawsuits brought by private attorneys uh, seeking uh, statutory damages, plus, which could be substantial per illegal call uh, added up plus attorney's fees. Um, I, I love this. I read this and I stole it from, from an, another writer uh, who, who was talking about how some of these rules have, have been sort of amorphous. They just, we're not sure. We, we're not given like you can make X number of calls or you can call specific times and, and they're not doing it. What, what their, their feds are going by uh, is if it's illegal, I'll know it when I see it kind of like the old definition of obscenity. I can't tell you what it is, but I know it when I see it. And, and that's problematic because that means someone's making a determination after the fact without you really even knowing what the target is. Uh, and so look at what you're doing. Look at it from the standpoint of an outsider who doesn't understand the subprime business. Would they think that this would be uh, harassment or is this going overboard? And the other thing is, is it even effective? Is it even, if it's not effective, don't do it. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure how just calling someone over and over and over several times a day really is helping you with your collections. Maybe I'm wrong, but uh, look at it and just say, is it effective? Is it doing any good? If it's not doing any good, why take the risk? Let's just move on. Um, okay. State law also comes into play here uh, through the, the uh, Texas Deceptive Trade Practice Act, or if you have a UDAP in your state, um, the, they piggyback onto it, and the reason they piggyback onto the Texas DTPA is because it authorizes, in some cases, triple damages plus attorney's fees and so on. Um, and, and so we, we have that. We also have uh, a Texas law that's in the finance code um, on what actions a, a uh, collector can't take. And the thing about the state law is it applies to creditors as well as third-party collectors, whereas the federal law, by and large, not totally, but by and large, a lot of the provisions apply only to third-party collectors. So they can backdoor you sometimes through the state law into a violation, even though you're the direct creditor. Um, ask yourself the question, again, is it reasonable what I'm doing in the view of an outsider, not, not an insider, but an outsider, is it reasonable, is it fair 
Um, and is it effective? Number six, uh, repossession cure letters. Um, here's the problem. Some states require a pre-repossession notice or a cure period notice or something like that. Texas does not. Texas has no such requirement. But, here's the, the but is the, is the important part here. Courts have held that acceptance of, of partial or late payments in the past can serve as a message to the debtor that it is okay to make partial or late payments. Your acceptance of that per partial performance is a statement that it's okay. And then if you just decide unilaterally you're not gonna do this anymore and you go pop the car, there have been some courts that have said that's unfair because these people were led by your actions to think that it's okay and for you to suddenly pop their car is not fair. Okay, that's called waiver or estoppel. Those are the legal concepts here. I do not know of one buy here, pay here dealer in the state of Texas, I can't go beyond the boundaries, I don't, I don't really know, but I do not know of one in Texas that doesn't accept later or, or partial payments occasionally. Actually, there is one who just says, I won't do it. He refuses them, just refuses them. Does he come back with the full payment or you're in breach? And, uh, but most, it's part of the, it's the nature, again, the nature of the business is, is you work with these people. They don't have unlimited resources. You work with them. You help them out. You're doing them a favor, for God's sake. And that favor is what's going to come back to bite you on the butt. Uh, and, and so be aware uh, that if you are accepting later partial payments, you can't just make a unilateral turn, uh, unilateral turn off the faucet. Uh, and a cure letter is what you do. You send this cure letter, and there's a form in your materials. Uh, and it, it says uh, that uh, in the past, we've accepted later partial payments. From here on out, you need to bring your account current, and we will not accept later partial payments. Of course, you need to have your, your payment people understand that, that if, if this flag is filed uh, on a cure letter and they come in and try to make a partial payment, you either reject it or if you accept it, you're back in the same hole you were in before. And, and I'm recommending, uh, before I used to be sort of ambivalent on whether to use it, uh, you have language in your contract that waives any waiver or estoppel, uh, and some of the courts have said, well, if it's in the contract, it's enforceable, but other courts have said no. I'm leaning now toward using it simply because now the feds are getting involved and they're looking at the fairness of the situation, uh, and they may take action where, say, the Texas courts have said, no, there's no problem because of the waiver in the contract language, but the feds may say, we just think it's unfair. And, and so I, I would recommend using the cure letter, even here in Texas, where you don't have to send a pre-repossession letter. By the way, in my form, I do not use the R word. It ain't in there. Because I, I had a, when I, I first talked about using this cure letter, I had a dealer say, hey, that, that's, that looks like a hide your car letter. I said, well, that may be part of it, but um, that's not the intent. Uh, but you do want to be safe. Number seven, uh, if you, you got any defects, uh, on the vehicle that you're aware of, you need to disclose it in writing. The worst kinds of cases that I have to handle for my dealer clients is one involving a swearing match. He said, she said. Again, a jury of 12 good and faithful citizens who are all car buyers are gonna be determining who's lying and who's telling the truth when you get in one of these swearing matches. Uh, I hate them. And so I love having a nice written disclosure uh, prior body damage on this vehicle where you found some Bondo, um, uh, any issue with the title, any branding, uh, make sure that it's disclosed in specific writing. And one, one of the, uh, the things that I find is when that buyer gets buyer's remorse, they start losing memory sales and they, f they forget what you had discussed with them verbally uh, about the particular issue. So get it in writing and have them sign it. And it does serve as a defense. And I've had cases where we get the demand letter from an attorney, it's just a buyer's remorse case. Demand letter from the attorney, oh, you, you misrepresented this, you misrepresented that. And we pull out this disclosure letter that the dealer had signed and, and uh, initialed off by the, the consumer, fax a copy of it to the attorney and never hear anything back again. So uh, it does serve a purpose. 
uh, and it's something that I think should be a part of your closing packet is, is looking for any of those kinds of issues that you would verbally disclose. Well, let's do it in writing. Number eight, beware of the Service Person Civil Relief Act requirements. Uh, I am seeing some activity in this, both private lawsuits as well as obviously the feds are, are very much involved in protecting service people. This applies to persons entering active duty after the contract. If you're dealing with people who are already in the military on active duty, this doesn't apply because the intent here is to protect people who, who go into the service and take a drop in pay in order to put their life on the line to defend our freedoms. Uh, and, and so it only applies to people who go on active duty after the contract is signed because theoretically they're taking lower pay. Um, if it applies to them, you cannot do self-help repossession. You've got to get a court order to take possession back of the property upon, upon breach. Um, it requires a reduction of the interest to 6% as of the date of active duty. You have to go back, redo the contract, lower the payments, um, and so on at that 6% rate. Um, now, here's, here's where an issue comes up occasionally, um, is typically they bring you the papers from the government saying so-and-so has been activated, um, be attached to this unit uh, as of such and such a date. Um, and so you can verify that, uh, which I suggest you do um, on the uh, Department of Defense website. There is a, a place you can verify. Uh, sometimes they just get a letter. The dealer gets a letter from, from the consumer saying, I've gone on active duty, and it's not the official papers. You can't ignore it just because it's not official papers. It's like bankruptcy stuff. If you're put on any kind of notice, you're on notice, and you've got to do some due diligence. Now, there have been cases, uh, run into a case in Dallas, where people were, were fraudulently reproducing these uh, I'm going on active duty letters to commit mortgage fraud on houses to get the, the lender not to, to take the house back. It's a fraud going on. I suppose it could happen with a car too. So, but again, do your due diligence. Don't assume one way or the other. Uh, but if you get any kind of a whiff of information from someone saying, I'm going on active duty, then you need to delve into it and not just ignore it. Uh, and that's been proven by a couple of cases. Uh, this Alabama case, is one not, not well, it, 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 he wasn't ignoring it. He was advised of the military activation of a reservist he had prior sold a vehicle to. He refused to lower the interest rate, and he went out and repossessed the vehicle, even after he was given the official documents. Now, he is now under indictment for felony charges. This is serious stuff. And this, this, if you've been reading any of the, the materials uh, on the, on the, the federal uh, Consumer Protection Bureau, this is top priority, protecting, protection of our military people. And so they're focusing in on it. So be aware, uh, do your due diligence if you get whiff that there may be something going on. Number nine, uh, I, I, I mentioned this because I've gotten a, a number of cases here recently. Um, if you are using strict foreclosure, um, you may be reporting a deficiency knowingly or unknowingly to the credit bureau. Now, uh, in your materials, there's an explanation of what is the difference between strict foreclosure and private sale. So if you're not familiar with that difference, familiarize yourself. A lot of dealers in Texas, a lot of buyer pay here dealers are using strict foreclosure. Uh, it's easier, it's faster, you get the vehicle back instead of having to sell it, account for the proceeds, do a balance sheet, uh, possibly have to refund some equity. Uh, so it, it's the, the method of choice. The problem is you're forgiving the deficiency when you do a strict foreclosure, which is called acceptance of, of collateral satisfaction. It is satisfaction of the obligation. And we've had some, some dealers whose, whose uh, software was automatically sending deficiency information to the credit bureau. And that's a violation, violation of fair credit reporting. Uh, and so be aware uh, that, that if you're doing strict foreclosure, there is no deficiency and you cannot report one uh, and, and, and what we learned from the first investor's case down here, uh, what, $12.5 million fine, is the software was doing it, and they tried to fix the software but couldn't get it fixed, but they just let it keep going, and, and uh, 
they got that hit by the feds pretty hard. So make sure your software is doing what it's supposed to be doing and make sure you're telling it to do what you want it to do and make sure you're not sending deficiencies to credit bureau uh, after these strict foreclosures. Um, so just, yeah, remember that erases the balance and, and do your due diligence to make sure that, that everything is being done right. Number 10, automatic bankruptcy stay. I'm still getting a lot of, lot of uh, litigation on this, both through the bankruptcy court and uh, uh, the, the bankruptcy court itself, as well as from the private attorney, the debtor's attorney, bringing an adversary action in the bankruptcy. Just rule number one, and, and just take this to heart, this is... This will answer nine-tenths of your questions about bankruptcy. Bankruptcy trumps everything. Well, how about if my customer doesn't have insurance? Bankruptcy trumps everything. How about if they get behind on payments to the trustee? Bankruptcy trumps everything. It's the answer to every question you ever had about bankruptcy. Well, do I have any remedies? Yes, you can go in the bankruptcy court and have the bankruptcy rules modified if you have grounds. Uh, but do not take any unilateral action such as repossession or any kind of collection activities regardless of status of insurance or any of these other things. What, what I'm finding is violations uh, are often brought to the attention of the judge. Judges are issuing large fines. I mentioned this Meeks case out of Florida, $35,000. I've seen a $20,000 fine here in Dallas against the dealer. Worst case, didn't involve a fine, Dealer was ignoring the bankruptcy notices because the debtor had filed pro se by himself and was handwriting out these, these forms and notices of hearings and, and delivering them to the dealer. And the dealer said, hey, that's not official bankruptcy stuff. I'm ignoring it. Uh, well, one day, about six black unmarked cars armed with federal agents surrounded his lot, closed it down, arrested him and his collection manager took him to the federal courthouse where he was strip searched, brought him before the judge to explain why they were ignoring the bankruptcy proceedings and, and the rules uh, and so on. And the judge wasn't at all interested that, that the, the, the notices were handwritten on a, uh, on a legal pad. Didn't, didn't bother the judge at all. Uh, fortunately, he called clients office called my office, we got someone down there, apologized to the judge, said he understands now, it won't happen again, judge, and we avoided the big fine, but he went through a lot of indignity uh, over that, and he won't do that again. All right, any questions? I've trying, gone through this pretty quickly, I'm not even sure what time, how much time we have left, but uh, a lot of material, and be happy to field any questions you might have about any of these items. Yes, sir. It's possible to ask the question. I'm not sure it's going to be possible to give you an answer, but I'll try. Ten ninety nine C's. Well, I'm not an accountant, and I usually refer this to the accountant types. I do know, though, that a rule has been made pretty clear. If you have a related finance company, you're obligated to do a 1099, even on these strict foreclosures where you're forgiving this indebtedness or anything you write off if you're doing private sales. Um, I, my understanding is they're not applying it to a dealership. You don't fall under the same rules, apparently. Now, if you're asking, can I use it as a sword, as a tool, collection tool, um, I don't know of anything that says you can't turn in a 1099 even if you're not required to as a dealer. I don't know, is that your question? Is that where you're, you were going with that? My understanding is until we get further word, you do. Uh, there was a dealer uh, in Dallas uh, who was audited by the IRS, and they actually laid down an assessment uh, for not sending. He had an RFC, but he wasn't sending out the 1099. Actually, nobody was uh, at that time. Well, the word has gotten out, and I haven't heard anything to the contrary. I don't know, Steve, have you heard anything? Uh, uh, so I think that's still the operative rule until either the law has changed or a court rules on it or, or someone changes it. I, I think the safe thing with your RFC is to go ahead and send them out. Okay. 
All right. Anything else? Oh, yes. Regarding the collection calls, if we have one collector calling for their payment and someone else calling for insurance, would that be considered harassment? Okay, question. And one collector calling for insurance, one just on the collections. Uh, I, I wouldn't think so. First of all, it's only two calls. Now, if they're each calling six times a day, it might be a problem. But just the mere fact that you have two different people doing different functions, I don't see that in and of itself as being a problem. It's going to go to how many calls are being made uh, to determine if there, there, there is some type of uh, reason to worry. And, and by the way, the other thing uh, I wanted to mention about if you have a robo-caller, I think there is a capability of recording uh, the number of calls to what phone number, even the message. Um, and, and we were able in this one case in federal court uh, to get that information, pull that information, a lot of work and a large file uh, electronically to send over, but um, uh, make sure you're keeping those records. And even on your, your, uh, your manual calls, uh, make sure you're keeping good collector's notes and be aware that those collector's notes will probably be uh, brought into evidence if there is a lawsuit. And so, uh, that, you know, they should reflect what, what is being done legally. Yes, sir. Okay, question is, under the Service Person Civil Relief Act, interest rate gets lowered to 6%. Uh, and the question was, did I say that a new contract had to be signed? The answer is no. The answer is no. A no. No new contract needs to be signed, but you need to certainly make the entries in your system so that you're not sending out collection activity reflecting the old higher interest rate. But there, there is no, in fact, yeah, it's probably a good idea not to have a new contract signed because that creates some other issues. Make, make notations. You can uh, stick something on uh, the, the, the contract, to, a note to remind anybody who, who goes into the file uh, that it's flagged. You were, you were talking about uh, exempt vehicles and mileage. Uh, how exactly is that supposed to be disclosed on the secure odometer statement in the title app and potentially on the purchase order if a car is exempt? Well, I, I think you, you put exempt on the title certificate where the official federal disclosure is made if the vehicle is, over, in fact, over 10 years old. But you going back to your contract to your, your, your buyer's order, um, that is more concerned, I think, with your consumer dealer relationship and disclosing accurately uh, the, the nature of the, of the vehicle and um, you know, you may want to make a notation. If you know that the miles are wrong on there, you may want to make some notation and then clarify that with that, that, uh, the old-fashioned odometer statement by, by writing in what is your question, what is your issue, what you're disclosing or warning the buyer about and have them sign off on it. Uh, yeah, I, you know, the buyer's, buyer's order, you, you possibly, if you do make a, a, a good solid uh, uh, odometer disclosure at, at closing, you, 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 I don't know, you may, may just put what's on the odometer, but you may want to just make a notation um, that vehicle is exempt and there is an issue with the miles. Just, I, I, I know what I'm saying here sounds like it's overkill, but if you get involved in one of these lawsuits, that overkill may be what saves your bacon. I have a question over here, sir. Yeah. Uh, pertaining to the odometer disclosure statement that we use, um, is it kind of contradicting itself if the odometer disclosure statement says exempt and doesn't list the actual mileage? If the vehicle is exempt, you can put on the, the odometer, the federal odometer disclosure on the title that it is exempt. You can also put that, I believe, on, on your other documents, but you may want to, um, giving, given that, that there is potential 
uh, state UDAP liability, you may want to make additional disclosure other than exempt. But exempt is a usable term to meet the federal requirements. It's not adequate to describe an issue, a problem that that vehicle has if you get into a state court lawsuit. Okay. Thanks, sir. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Yeah, the question is, if you have a vehicle that is exempt, that doesn't automatically mean the miles are not true. That's correct. Are you going to, I mean, when you say it's exempt, are you defining exempt for the customer? No, actually, I would say exempt would be adequate if there is no problem with the miles. The problem is you don't necessarily know that, um, or you may have a suspicion that there may be an issue, or you may have actual knowledge. Uh, obviously, those all need to be disclosed. So shouldn't you use a, um, give them, say, an auto check or a Carfax that would back you up that is actual? You know. Uh, that, well, that's a whole other question uh, because a lot of times those documents are wrong. And I've had dealers who were sued over a mileage issue, and one of the allegations was, you handed me this printout from this company uh, saying that they are the standard of accuracy uh, and, and it had improper miles on it. That was part of your scheme to defraud me, was the allegation on the lawsuit. Uh, and so having running a Carfax isn't the be-all. In fact, that's their, their term. It ain't the be-all and end-all. Uh, and in fact, there may well be information they don't have access to that's going to pop up later. And that's what worries me. So you're using your expertise to say, you know, this, this odometer says 60,000 miles, but I see signs this thing has more or whatever, and that's when you, if you have that suspicion, that's when you may want to make some additional disclosure to your customer. And, you know, on that issue of the Carfax, uh, I've also had folks say, um, not only accuse the dealer of conspiring with Carfax, as it were, to, to mislead them, but I've also, um, um, you know, had situations where, of course, Carfax has all these disclaimers, we don't guarantee this, or they have a guarantee, but it's, very narrow in what it covers. It's not going to cover your usual problem. Um, and uh, you, you see this issue, too, where Carfax says, besides, we didn't have a contract with the consumer. We sold this to the dealer. Um, and, so, and, and of course, they're not going to back you up as a dealer. So you may want to, instead of buying it yourself and putting it out there for your customer to back up what you hope is, is true information, you may want to consider saying, look, you want to go buy one, I'll, I'll knock $20 off the sale price of this vehicle, and here's the phone, you can you know, order one and get it yourself. Let them do business with Carfax instead of you. Um, and so you're out of the, the chain. Now, so, so would you suggest, say, uh, having them uh, initial off on a statement that this vehicle is exempt and the mileage may or may not be correct? You know, that's something good to write in um, on that odometer form, a separate odometer form. It's not acceptable for federal purposes, but it's between you and your customer to say um, in that situation, this vehicle is exempt from federal odometer disclosure requirements, but um, the miles may not be accurate. Thank you very much. Sure. Okay. Are we out of time? Are we got time left? Okay. Any other questions? I had a question about dealing with a customer from hell. When you're in the middle of the deal and they've made a couple payments and you decide you do have a problem on your hands and you do want to get out of the deal, uh, what are the best ways to do that? The easiest and most direct way to get out of a deal is just say, I'm going to give you all your money back. 
assuming then that they might not be cooperative with that. Yeah, no, and that's entirely possible. Uh, but one of the things uh, that, that I recommend that, that my client do is make that offer in writing because that a tender of, of any damages that this person has can serve as a defense against a deceptive trade lawsuit. And the problem I see is quite often a dealer will verbally say to a customer, I'm going to give you all your money back. You can go down the street, harass somebody else. Uh, we're clear. I'm going to drop any, any obligation. You get your money back. I get my car, get my title. Everything's, everything's fine. The customer says, nope, I want blood money. You did a bad thing. You're a bad guy. And my, my friend who just got out of jail uh, talked to someone in jail who said, hey, you know, when, when something like that happens, you're entitled to thousands of dollars blood money. Okay. They'll go to an attorney, tell their story. Attorney sends a letter, a threatening letter. My God, you cheated this person. You did this. You did that. I whip out that written letter and say, look, we, we tendered this money. Usually the attorney backs off at that point and says, yeah, let's go ahead and do that um, because it'll serve as a defense. See, if he, he wants to file a deceptive trade claim and seek multiple damages and attorney's fees, that tender offer probably has taken him out of the ballpark. And certainly when we get an official 60-day demand letter, we do make a, I, I, in all my cases, make some type of tender offer. The dealer says, isn't that an admission of guilt? And I said, nope. It's a defense that's going to save you a lot of money. We're going to make a tender offer because it puts the, the plaintiff's lawyer in a conundrum. Do I accept it and make my client whole, or do I turn it down and go forward with the prospect that the judge is going to say, hey, tender offer was made, no punitive damages, no attorney's fees? And, and a lot of times we find that serves as the kind of leverage we need to get something settled when you have an, uh, an uncooperative. However, I find in most cases when they're offered money back, it's hard to say no. Uh, and, and so that may be the thing that, that gets the deal done. And, you know, and again, everything is negotiable. Uh, give them the title of the car. If there's just a small amount left and, and the headaches outweigh the balance, offer them that. That may be what satisfies them. Um, just try to figure something out, the end goal being to get rid of them rather than restructure the deal and keep going forward because it ain't going to get better, I promise you. It ain't going to get better. Okay, any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, question is, you give them a uh, title of the car to get a release sign. Absolutely. Anytime you give anything, you get a release sign. And, and the release, um, you know, needs to say, uh, have the magic language, release you from any and all claims, suits, uh, allegations going forward, including, and I, you know, I have language including a, a claim under the Texas Deceptive Trade Practices Act or violation of the finance code. It's, it's pretty... Invasive, and let me tell you, these things work. Um, had a dealer um, who who was using uh, the the form that was in my book, in my green book, um, as, as a release, and um, he would do minor repairs occasionally, replace a water pump or something. And he would tell the customer, "I'm going to pay for this. I have no obligation to. I'm going to for goodwill, but I want you to sign a release." Well, that release is effective and recognized by the courts. You, know, you can't get one signed at closing because you don't have consideration. But afterwards, you give consideration, you can get a release. And, and here's, here's what happened in this, this one case. Uh, there was a, a, about 10, 12 years ago, there was a, a class action lawsuit filed against about 300 dealers in the state of Texas uh, by a couple of attorneys. Uh, actually, there were several attorneys that were involved in this group. Um, allegations of, of uh, uh, sales tax fraud. Of, it, it was really nebulous stuff, and, and, and it ended up eventually going away uh, about a million dollars later. Uh, but this one dealer who, who was getting these types of releases, the plaintiff who had named him in the class action, uh, he went and pulled out his file. Sure enough, he had replaced a water pump on that car and got him to sign this 
release. And it could be maybe gave title to it or, or you know, whatever consideration. And he pulled out this release. We sent it over to the class action attorneys. They immediately dropped that dealer from the class action. Those things are effective. So, yeah, a release backed by consideration. So always, whenever you give up anything, whether it be money or repair services or, or anything that is consideration to your customer, get a release. And get a bro as broad a release as you can. Okay, any other questions? All right. I think they're questioned out. Okay, well, I'm through. I appreciate your attention. It's been fun visiting with you, and hope to see you soon. Thanks.